So welcome to this talk um, on the short history of the South of the Forest with Mark Gorman and Peter Williams. Um, it's being organised by the RAIN Group. I think a lot of you probably know who we are and what we do. But we're basically a, quite a large now circle of um, people of all ages and backgrounds and interesting in uh, Wanstead Park, Wanstead Flats and to the north, Hollow Ponds and Leighton Flats, with interest in both the history and also the conservation of wildlife on the site. Um, it's a fantastic area and at the moment it's one of those great places to see and hear skylarks singing at the moment. We've got the fenced off area for you to, to enjoy the, the, the skylarks in, 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 in the park or the flats. We are a charity, um, we're all volunteers, so everything that you see here and here today is done by volunteers working for the public good. Um, so if you are interested in coming and joining us and helping out, there's the um, link at the bottom there. You can click on that later on and there's one in the chat as well and you can come and join us and help out. So on this session, um, in terms of good practice, what we want to do. So we've already muted you. So can you stay muted unless you've been asked to speak? There will be opportunities to ask questions at the end of the talk. Um, you can raise your hand virtually. I've just realised I haven't got my little uh, laser pointer to make things a little bit easier. So you can raise your hand virtually to get our attention and you can click on the reactions button and then click on raise hand. Um, again, during the talk, it'll probably be easier if you um, leave that until we actually have the question and answer session at the end. Um, if you aren't going to talk to us, remember to unmute yourself by clicking on the mute button down on the bottom left. Um, you can type your questions in the chat box. You can click on the chat box and have a look at that. Do use that to uh, um, uh, record questions and we can review those at the end. Uh, and also if there are any question and answer sessions, again, you can use yes, no options and you can give some applause as well using the reactions button. We are recording the, the session. So if you don't want to be on record or rec recorded forever, just stop your video so that uh, you can't be seen. And we do recommend that you use the side by side setup if you want to see who's talking. Uh, click on view in the top right of your screen up here somewhere and you should be able to uh, change the way you actually view uh, the session. Um, we can't offer much in the way of support, but if you have any technical issues, send a message to the chat box and somebody should be able to help you out with that. If you are having issues with the sound, I presume you can hear me hear us now, so it's probably OK. Uh, but do make sure you, your speakers are selected appropriately. And if the quality of your sound drops off or the video is poor, then either stop, stop your video, which you've probably done anyway. Make sure there are no other devices in your area using your Wi-Fi system. So keep the bandwidth down and close any background apps on your device. And that should help. So without too much further ado, just in, uh, introduce you to uh, Mark Gorman and Peter Williams. Um, I did have a little biography here, which for some reason has dropped off my uh, uh, view. So in fact, I can't introduce them to you. I'll let them introduce and talk about themselves. I think that's probably the easiest way of doing it. Um, I'll be running the slides forward, so they'll be advancing the slides from their, their position of, of giving the talk. So without further ado, welcome Mark. Thanks very much, Tony, and uh, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining. Um, uh, as, as Tony said, uh, this is a bit different from the other REN group talks uh, that we've been running over the last year, in that we're focusing uh, less on the wildlife and more on the history, but we're trying to sort of show the way that how the southern forest, the southern part of Epping Forest in our area has been formed partly as a result of the impact of uh, the people who live in and around it, on it, and partly the way that the forest itself has impacted the, com the local communities. And the talk's going to be in two parts. Um, I'm going to do the first part of the earlier history and then Peter will take over to talk about the more recent part. And thank you, Tony, for moving on the slides. So um, could you move on the first slide, please? OK, this. so I'm starting with the Epping Forest Act, passed in August 1878 because it's probably the most important single moment in the history of forest. Um, the act was important for two reasons. Um, firstly, obviously it saved Epping Forest from development. It, the immediate impact was that the uh, City of London Corporation as the conservators of Epping Forest were given the uh, responsibility of keeping the forest open uh, for the recreation and enjoyment of the public and resisting uh, enclosures and building in the future, which was the 
pressure point in the past. Um, but um, there's also another reason why uh, the forest, um, uh, the Epping Forest Act is important. And the second reason is that it was the first time, I quote it here, the act says, it's to preserve the forest as an open space for the recreation and enjoyment of the public. And this was the first time that parliament had given a global right to everybody, not just to local people, but to everybody in the country to, to make use of an open space. And it was the origin really of the legal concept of the right to roam, uh, which that's what we call it today. Um, and indeed that great natural historian, Oliver Rackham, um, Cambridge um, uh, Don in the late 20th century, called the campaign to save Epping Forest uh, the origin of the modern British environmental movement. And it's hard to argue with that view. So next slide, please, Tony. Next slide, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, so our area has been settled probably for, since Anglo-Saxon times and probably earlier. Um, and the local manors, um, Wanstead, Aldersbrook, Walthamstow, Little Ilford and so on, and Can Hall, covered most of the southern forest. And they were all small forest hamlets for, in fact, for around the time of the Normans invasion and for many centuries thereafter. And although a certain amount of farmland um, was carved out of uh, Epping Forest, um, gradually and over time, grazing of um, animals became a much more lucrative and important um, element of the rural economy in the Southern Forest. But even so, by 1800, three quarters of, of uh, Wanstead Manor, for example, was still um, forest, looking probably a little bit like this, open wood pasture. This is actually uh, further north in Epping Forest. It's, um, it's Berry Wood, just north of Chingford. So next slide, Tony. Um, by contrast, uh, Wanstead Flats and probably Leighton Flats, uh, which were known, well, Wanstead Flats is known for many centuries as the Lower Forest. Um, they were open heathland, um, and we don't have open heathland on uh, Wanstead Flats anymore. So, but this is a photograph from the late 20th century of, of Hainault Forest, showing a little patch of, of um, surviving heathland. Um, common heather there and gorse um, and uh, that gives some idea what the flats might have been like um, in past centuries um, and the reason for that was that Wanstead Flats was grazed for many centuries by sheep in fact not not cattle um, in the earlier centuries but but um, sheep which were many of which were owned by Stratford Langthorne Abbey which stood on um, the Lee Marshes just south of the modern Stratford Centre um, and in the late 11th century they got um, a royal charter to graze a up to a thousand sheep between Forest Gate um, in the south and Walthamstow in the north. So this grazing and tree clearing um, in West Ham Manor just to the south of the forest sort of has ma maintained for many centuries maintained uh, the heathland, the acid soil which sort of suited heathland plants. Um, I have a confession to make here. I, for a long time, I assumed that Wanstead Heath was a, uh, a rarely used name that had been made, that had been uh, purloined by local estate agents to gentrify the area. Um, in fact, I've found recently that um, Wanstead Heath was very commonly used right up to the 19th century. And it's actually Wanstead Flats, which is the more recent name and probably uh, a result of um, probably linked to uh, meadow grazing, sort of because it's an Essex word for flatlands along the River Thames used for grazing. Um, and the heath really um, maintained its sort of peat like soil right into well into the 19th century um, and uh, um, caused many of the summer fires that were very common on the flats at that time. So, next slide, Tony, please. Um, sorry, this is a slightly small image. I couldn't make it any bigger without losing the, um, the uh, definition, but it just shows that many people made their living from the forest in quite informal ways. This is actually Hainault Forest in the mid 1850s, um, but it shows two things. One, it shows 
the importance of pigs to the local economy in the southern forest. It wasn't just sheep and cattle, uh, but pigs also um, played a big role. Um, and secondly, it shows that squatting in the forest is not a new phenomenon. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, another sort of major mainstay of the southern forest economy for a long time was uh, rabbits. Rabbit warrens um, were um, to be found both on Wanstead Flats and uh, further north in Wanstead itself. And they're remembered in local names, Warren Road in Wanstead and of course, Rabbits Road on the edge of Wanstead Flats. Um, and uh, they were substantial um, warrens. One of them, which is now buried under the City of London Cemetery, um, was owned by, uh, initially in the 1580s by the Earl of Pembroke, who had a thousand couple of rabbits there. Um, and uh, a successor of his in the next century tried to extend the warren further onto Wanstead Flats and got hauled before the manorial court for his pains. Um, but by the mid 18th century, a century after a century later, uh, the new um, tenant of, uh, of Aldersbrook Farm, which again was on the city of London's, where the city of London cemetery stands now, got permission to, um, to destroy the warren and enclose the land for agriculture. Uh, next slide, Tim. So, uh, but the major, uh, income earner for many people for many years were cattle and cattle became increasingly important in the southern forest um, particularly on Wanstead Fats uh, both for uh, locals who had common rights and increasingly for drovers who were bringing cattle to London from literally all over the country Scotland, uh, Wales, East Anglia we think maybe from Ireland as well and they would drive them down great cattle drives onto the flats um, uh, the Flats was one of a number of uh, locations around London where, which were fattening grounds, basically. The, the drovers would arrive with their herds in um, late winter. They'd spend, the cattle would be the, on the Flats for two or three months, and then there would be sales, cattle sales, which were conducted locally in um, the, uh, the Rabbit's Pub, which uh, the, the Victorian version of which some people may still remember on Romford Road, sadly no more. Um, but we know that very substantial sums of money be, uh, were involved because of newspaper reports in the late 1780s of a sensational robbery which took place at the, Rob at the Rabbit's pub um, when one of the agents for cattle salesmen from Scotland was robbed of, he, had, he was carrying £1,100 in banknotes and 260 guineas in cash, which in today's terms is not far off £100,000, um, enough to buy a very large number of cows. Um, the uh, the thief was uh, was caught. It turned out it was a, she was, it was a, she was a woman, and she um, she was uh, eventually sentenced to transportation to Australia, um, where she made good. In fact, uh, the cattle drives ended in the mid nineteenth century when the railways arrived. Cows began to be uh, transported directly into London by train. And so from, uh, from the mid 1850s, it was just local farmers who were um, using uh, Wanstead Flats for grazing. So next slide, Tim. And here we see, I wanted to put this one in because this shows uh, cattle on the flats at the Alexandra Lake. Um, some of you may know it stands just opposite, nearly opposite the gates of um, the City of London Cemetery. And you can see in the background that um, the ground is fairly clear. There's very little scrub to be seen. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if you went to the same spot today and looked across towards the City of London Cemetery gates, um, you, you'd see it very different, it covered with brambles and small trees, which are encroaching despite the fire damage that took place last summer. So the cows had a major impact on the ecology of, uh, of Bonstead Flats. Uh, next slide, please. They also had a major impact on the neighbourhood. Um, they survived into the 1990s on the flats, long enough to become famous locally for their wandering and eating habits. Um, and some of the more adventurous cows uh, made it across Romford Road and uh, up to the Green Man Roundabout. And uh, I remember being told um, some years ago by a keeper in uh, 
uh, West Ham Park that they uh, had to corral the cattle into the tennis courts in West Ham Park to await the arrival of the cowman who had a small moped. I, in fact, we remember it well, uh, puttering down the road on sunny summer mornings very early to get, get the cows back onto the flats. But sadly, the, um, uh, sadly, the 1990s saw the demise of cattle grazing on the flats. It was, it was a combination really of economics. It just wasn't economic for farmers anymore. Rising amounts of traffic in the locality, and there was one very bad accident involving a motorcyclist who was killed and he hit a cow at night. And uh, of course, BSC. So from 1996, we saw the end of, of summer grazing on Wanstead Flats. Next slide, please, Jim. Um, grazing predominated, but the Southern Forest also featured a number of arable farms uh, producing for the London market, of course. And here is one of them, Aldersbrook Farm, the first Aldersbrook Farm, which has now disappeared under the um, under the City of London Cemetery. The only um, trace of it is the, um, the sunken area, which is called the Columbarium or the catacombs in the middle of the cemetery, which was the site of the farm pond. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the, the newer Aldersbrook farm, which was built in 1863. Interestingly, it was, a, it was built as, a, we think, as a model farm, which meant that the farmhouse design was a standard one. They were built in a number of locations across Essex, and they were built to demonstrate modern farming methods to, um, to benighted farmers locally. Um, this uh, building survived until after the Second World War. This photograph was taken in 1946, by which time it had become a garage and filling station. You can just see the SO pump on the right. And um, next slide, please, Tony. This is what it looks like today um, on Aldersbrook Road, the SO filling station. The only survival of the farm now is the, is the rather beautiful wall which surrounds the back end of the, of the site here. Um, uh, much graffitied, but a beautiful 19th century wall. Um, next slide, please. The Wanstead House estate had a major impact on the locality when it was when it was um, uh, built and continues to have that uh, an impact today. It was close to London, it was close to the Royal Court and, and yet it was in a pleasant rural setting so it's very popular with um, a number of wealthy proprietors starting with um, uh, Queen Elizabeth's, um, well not starting with but one of the early ones was the Earl of Leicester um, in the 15, uh, 1570s and 80s, Queen Elizabeth's favorite. And of course, Queen Elizabeth stayed in the original Wanstead House during her progressions around the country. The estate was enclosed in the early 1500s and, and uh, farmland and park were created, but it was really with the purchase of, of Wanstead uh, Park by Sir Josiah Child, um, who had new money because he was governor of the East India Company. And he and his successors over the next century um, created um, the very formal park um, and gardens around the house and of course bought, built the magnificent Wanstead house and in fact you can still see a number of um, uh, uh, sort of relics of the of the Wanstead Park estate today for example um, the Heronry Pond, so sorry, the, the ponds from Heronry down to the ornamental waters were dug at this time, though of course they're much altered now. Um, and uh, the estate, um, the gates to the estate uh, uh, can be found on those of you who know Overton Drive, which is um, just in the sub southern edge of, of Wanstead. Um, you can still see the pillars of the old gateposts. And Wanstead Golf Club fe still features this lake, which you can see here, the, the basin, it was called. Um, that still survives um, as, a, as a hazard in Wanstead Golf Club. Uh, next slide, Tim. Um, here is the avenue in Bushwood, which was um, another feature of the Wanstead Park estate. Long avenues of trees radiated out from the house. And, Relics of these trees can be found dotted around the neighborhood. Um, this, this is probably the best preserved of the avenues. Um, it's still um, there today in Bushwood. It was called Evelyn's Avenue and you can still trace it today. This Edwardian postcard shows it as it was actually um, 
the interesting the ground very very denuded of, of any cover um it was a popular meeting place um in victorian Edward, or edwardian times and peter is going to talk about that a bit later uh, next slide please tony so um the story of the collapse of family fortunes um of the of the um successor families to the child family the tilney longs um uh, this, the, the story of the marriage of Catherine Tilney Long to the dastardly William Wellesley Pole has been told, retold a number of times, um, and um, you can find uh, full gory details online. Um, my, um, I, my interest here is just to say that because William Wellesley Pole, um, who married Catherine Tilney Long, the richest heiress in England in 1812, because he'd spent her whole fortune within 10 years um, and was fleeing to the continent from the creditors. Um, the estate was broken up, uh, the house was demolished, nobody wanted it anymore and sold off for building material. Um, and the, uh, but, but some of the park remained in trust because um, uh, the trustees of the, uh, of the family very sensibly decreed that the heirs of Catherine and William should not have to suffer because of his um, uh, spendthrift ways. So part of the estate was retained in trust and it really went to sleep for about 60 years. This shows Perch Pond in Wanstead Park and um, the only visitors to Perch Pond and the other lakes would have been fishermen who got licenses from the trustees and, uh, and people um, who were uh, and shooters uh, there were shooting was still quite common actually um it's interesting how many newspaper reports there are of people having shotguns and, and guns in their houses in in the local area in the 19th century um next slide please Jim. so wanted flats latent flats um re and and the area around the park were uh, all common land um throughout um, most of the 19th century and they were unregulated so they were home to many itinerant groups at the time um, and particularly gypsy communities used to come to the flats to spend the winter before heading out onto the road again and uh, here is um, Wanstead Flats in 18, the early 1870s um, engraved by a local artist um, showing the caravan of one of uh, the many gypsy families who lived uh, who spent the winter on Wanstead Flats and Leighton Flats. Um, and uh, showing, showing it's still very much an unregulated open space. And, but, but it was also increasingly being used by uh, people from London. Working people were beginning to have the time and a bit more money to spend and the transport access uh, to get into uh, the southern end of Epping Forest, particularly when the railway came to Forest Gate in the 1840s, um, uh, excursions started almost straight away from inner London uh, out to uh, the southern edge of the forest. Um, next slide, please, Tony. But just as working people could begin to enjoy the open spaces on the edge of London, the development of the city itself began to endanger them. London grew exponentially in the 19th century. It grew from a population of 1 million in 1800 to 7 million on the eve of the First World War. Um, and in 1851, an event occurred which profoundly shocked Londoners and, awa and awakened them to the dangers that, uh, that, they, that the open spaces uh, faced. Um, in 1851, in the summer of 1851, Hainault Forest, which is part of Epping Forest across the river roading, was suddenly sold by the Crown Estate. And in six weeks, it was enclosed, uh, the trees were felled and, the, and farms were laid out. Um, and this caused profound shock in London. There, there'd never been such, there'd been enclosures, but there'd never been such an abrupt and uh, ruthless, really, um, destruction of an area of open land near London. And uh, uh, a campaign immediately began to, to gather force. And people like Charles Dickens here, writing very characteristically in his, in his magazine, um, uh, Household Words, um, 
you know, wonderful image. The more we extend our wilderness of brick and mortar, the, the, the more we must take care of the natural wilderness beyond and make sure it continues to be accessible. So, so a campaign really began to mobilize in uh, the 1850s and 60s. Next slide, please, Tony. Um, and protests uh, really gathered force in the late 1860s as enclosures began to really ramp up. Um, there was, uh, oh, so we seem to have leapt on. Um, there was a, uh, the Metropolitan Commons Act of 1866 promised to, um, uh, to protect uh, open space in London and um, landed proprietors got the message that they better um, quickly enclose what they could before the act came into force. So the late 1860s, there was a, a massive upsurge of, um, of uh, enclosures in London. Epping Forest became a symbol of the campaigns to preserve the space. It was much loved, heavily used open space, and it was, it was profoundly threatened by building development and aristocratic local landowners. Um, and the popular newspapers of the day, Reynolds's newspaper was the biggest selling uh, uh, paper of the 19th century and sold millions, sold copies in, uh, in millions actually by, uh, at its peak. Um, and as you can see, Reynolds's did not have a very high opinion of, um, uh, of the landed gentry, um, particularly of this man in 1871. This, is, uh, this man is Viscount Cowley. He was the Lord of the Manor of Wanstead. And in 1871, in, in the summer of 1871, his agents, um, on his instructions, inc abruptly enclosed a very large section of Wanstead Flats, fenced it off, um, and, uh, and it was rightly feared that they were intending to sell it off for building land. Um, and as you can see, this is what Reynolds is said about um, people like uh, Cowley, uh, tyrannical, selfish and rapacious. Uh, but, the, but the campaign didn't stop there. Next slide, please. Um, Sadly, we don't have any photographs of uh, the campaigns for open spaces in, at this time. Um, and we have to rely on newspaper sketches and cartoons like this. And uh, uh, because um, cartoons uh, sort of replaced photographic images, they had to be very graphic. And here is one from another popular newspaper read widely by the working class, the Penny Illustrated newspaper it's called. And it shows a woodman here felling a tree um, entitled Rights of the People, um, which is about to topple over onto a picnic party in Epping Forest. Um, in the background, you can see the Lord of the Manor watching on, having given his instructions to, to enclose the forest and clear it. Um, you can see a little sign there which says Crown Lands, which indicated the fact that um, the Crown still had um, ancient rights in, in uh, Epping Forest, which it could use if it wanted to, to prevent enclosures. Meanwhile, in the foreground, you can see John Bull vainly trying to wake up the forces of law and order who are taking absolutely no notice um, of the destruction going on around them. Um, well, the forces of law and order may not have taken any notice, but next slide, please, Tony. Uh, but um, East Londoners certainly did. and. Um, on July the 8th, 1871, it'll be 150 years this, this summer. I shall be out on the flats marking the day. Um, this uh, protest meeting was called for Wanstead Flats to save the forest, save Epping Forest from development. And 30,000 people, it was estimated, answered the call. It is probably the biggest single crowd that's ever gathered on Wanstead Flats. Um, and uh, it, it resulted in, well, the, the gentlemen leaders of the campaign uh, asked for um, a peaceful protest. They then went home and the crowd took the opportunity to um, take the fences apart and leave them as matchwood on the ground. Um, the newspapers, of course, all, and Parliament condemned this sort of violence, but actually it resulted in, a, in an effort uh, an act being rushed through Parliament a month later, which was the first of four acts passed in the 1870s, which protected Epping Forest from development um, and gave the City of London the responsibility of managing the forest. So, uh, next slide, please, Tony. Um, 
But the Epping Forest Act of 1878 sadly did not completely protect the forest and, um, and it continued to be under pressure from building development. And here we can see the paradox of uh, London development um, around 1900. Uh, in the foreground, the urchins are playing in a little pond, which is probably now the Jubilee Pond on the western end of Wanstead Flats, which was dug, as Peter will be saying um, in a few minutes, um, which was dug uh, out later. And in the background, you can see Dames Road being, houses being constructed on the left there, you can see houses under construction. So um, house building was lapping right up to the edge of, of the forest. Um, so the very resource that people wanted to preserve was being threatened by the places they were living in. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, apologies for the, uh, the rather um, uh, out of focus um, map here. Uh, I couldn't find another image to show uh, another um, threat to the, uh, to the flats, which was a brick field, which was constructed in 1864. And Tony's going to show where it is. It's, it's actually on Aldersbrook Road, there it is, and it's just south of Aldersbrook Road. You can see the farm there, uh, which I reported, uh, talked talk about earlier, and um, it goes up, the, so the, it goes into that sort of corner between Aldersbrook Road and Centre Road. Um, and of course it's still there today um, as an open, a grassed open space. It's still called the Brickfield, of course, um, and you can, I hope those with keen eyesight can see um, uh, it says clay pit and clay mills. Um, 500,000 bricks a year were being made on this site and again our old friend Viscount Cowley had handed over a lease to a London builder for 17 years and uh, despite complaints from local residents this continued to be an eyesore until it was abandoned um, in 1881. So there were still threats to um, the Southern Forest, even after the Epping Forest Act. Next slide, please, Tony. Um, and this is how they left that part of Wanstead Flats by 1900. Uh, you can see the ground very degraded. Um, uh, the clay and brick earth had all been taken away. Um, and this is, this is looking south towards uh, Forest Gate. The centre road is on the right for those of you who are familiar with the area. And uh, next slide, please, Tony. And this is what um, the Brickfield, the western end of the Brickfield site looks like today. Um, this bank, um, which um, butts up onto Centre Road, shows the extent of the digging. The ground does rise here as well, but even so, um, half a million bricks a year over 17 years takes a lot of clay. And, um, but today it's produced um, uh, an unknown fringe of the flats, which is as a rich variety of vegetation. You've got bramble, the hawthorn, and gorse. Um, and the City of London uh, cut the slope annually uh, to allow meadow grass flora to thrive. And, um, and I, on a spring or summer day, even I know that this is a good place to look for day flying moths and butterflies. Um, but I'm beginning to uh, encroach on other territory. So at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Peter. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Yes, I'm Peter Williams, and uh, I'm going to pick up the story. Um, I got to know the flats really well once I got a dog in the early 2000s and started wandering around and noticed many lumps and bumps and bits of concrete and uh, became intrigued about their history. As Mark has explained, um, by the 1880s, when the City of London took over as the conservator, the, the ground conditions on Wanstead Flats um, were actually extremely poor in many ways. And um, as it was taken over by the public authorities, they started a process of restoration. And in particular, laying out uh, playing fields, and that's the origin of the many football fields. There were far more in those days than there are now. Next slide, please. 
and uh, not only restoration, but um, a little later um, in the uh, late 1890s and into the early 20th century, there were many public works projects taking place both in the on the flats and, and indeed in Wansdale Park. And um, this is a fascinating photo of, of one of the ponds being dug. It's a bit debatable which pond this is. It could be the, um, the, the Jubilee Pond, um, which was then called the Model Yacht Pond, or it could indeed be um, Angel Pond at the corner of Capel Road and Woodford Road. It's, it's a little uncertain, but it perfectly illustrates what was effectively what we call a job creation scheme. So local unemployed men were engaged by um, uh, and paid by a local committee of uh, the great and the good to mitigate the effects of unemployment. And um, once the flats and once the park um, benefited to a considerable degree from these projects, which in effect were publicly funded to uh, make enhancements to the flats. Next. And uh, this, is a, this is a picture of the, of, of the model yacht pond on uh, Dames Road. Now, renamed as the Jubilee Pond. And um, as you can see, this was a pretty serious business um, around about 1900 um, with these very grand, um, expensive yachts that were raced uh, across the lake. It was one of a number of um, sort of uh, recreational activities that took place. Interestingly, the, um, the uh, flying of model aircraft um, dates back to a similar era. It started around 1908-1909. Notice also um, <clears throat> this doesn't look like a working class hobby. These are expensive yachts the, and, and the men, and they are men I'm afraid, uh, are pretty uh, well dressed and uh, look uh, fairly uh, bourgeois. Next. And there were parts of the flats that um, became almost park-like. So this is the extreme southwest corner of Wanstead Flats where Capel Road meets Woodford Road. You can see the houses on Woodford Road. You can also see the tram. Um, Mark has talked about the importance of transport in opening up Wanstead Flats to uh, the populace of East London. And uh, it wasn't just the trains. In fact, arguably the trams were probably more important because they were cheaper. And there was a tram terminus um, just about 100 yards north of where that tram is shown. And uh, this is one of the uh, sort of water fountains. This one survives and can still be seen, although not in quite as good a condition as in this lovely colored postcard. And uh, just on the right, you can see uh, the pond. And that, that is um, the pond known as Angel Pond or Bandstand Pond. And this work, in fact, was carried out by West Ham Council. Although the land was controlled by the Corporation of London, this is actually just in the West Ham municipal boundary. And West Ham carried out this work and created this rather grand promenade. And uh, remnants of this survive. Um, the nice gravel surface has largely grown over, but the trees are there. And uh, it's a recognizable spot to those of you who know the flats well. Next. And there were many forms of recreation. Um, and perhaps one of the most famous is the fair. We've researched the origin of the fairs and um, they have a very interesting history, which you can read in, in uh, one of our booklets that uh, we'll mention later. Um, they seem to date back certainly to at least 1850 and probably earlier, and may well have their origins in, um, in the gypsy community that Mark's mentioned. The gypsies almost certainly haul, held horse fairs um, on the flats, and probably little side booths were set up during the horse fair, and the side booths became more and more elaborate, <coughs> and um, as uh, there was more working class, working class leisure time, these very elaborate fairs grew up. And this extraordinary booth owned by a man called Taylor, um, uh, they later came to show films that very, very early cinema was often in fairground booths. Notice also in right in the middle of the picture, there's a, um, a police officer keeping an eye on things and next to him, is one of the uh, forest keepers 
dressed in uh, riding habit, as you can see. Next. Mark has mentioned that uh, Bushwood in particular was um, the scene of um, quite large scale meetings of different kinds. This is near where the modern Green Man roundabout is. And um, the flats, in fact, were quite extensively used for um, religious and political meetings. This, uh, this cutting refers to um, a rather notorious character of the time called William Oddy, who was a, um, a Christian uh, missionary linked to uh, this uh, extraordinarily named Gospel Temperance Mission Hall, which was in Montague Road, no longer survived, sadly. There was a very strong linkage, of course, in the late 19th century between Christian evangelical preaching and um, uh, the um, evils of drink. So the linking of gospel and uh, temperance message was uh, at this time not particularly unusual. And uh, Oddi um, had many, many run-ins over many years with the Corporation of London uh, because the bylaws um, didn't really permit um, sort of religious preaching or political speeches on the flats. Um, but from time to time, Oddi was given a license by the, um, the Corporation of London, and then he would infringe the license and the license would be taken away. And then he'd lobby and appeal. And um, this went on for um, quite a number of years, um, right through from, the late 1880s right through until the later 1890s. And um, next, please. Mark has mentioned um, the gypsy community and uh, they were strongly associated with affairs and extraordinarily, they were also very um, strongly associated with religious revival and um, these three characters who were all uh, gypsies living in uh, caravans um, had strong links to William Booth um, from Whitechapel, uh, the founder of the um, Salvation Army. And um, there are accounts of very early um, activity by William Booth as he was, he was making the transition from a mainstream Methodist preacher to this new movement, the uh, Salvation Army, which was more radical in many ways than, than, than the Methodists. And gypsies were an important part of that story. And uh, these three were, uh, the Smith brothers were famous uh, gypsy evangelists. And um, so once de Flats plays quite an important role in the, uh, the history of the Salvation Army. Next. And here's perhaps the most famous of them all, uh, Gypsy Simon Smith, who, who traveled um, very extensively preaching uh, at this period and uh, even ended up in uh, North America and uh, was quite a famous character. And uh, here he is with these rather wonderful uh, Gypsy caravans. And um, a relative of these, um, men um, lived just behind the Lord Rookwood pub on Can Hall Road for many, many years. And um, her van, uh, although it was not a mobile van, but it was a wooden van, survived um, indeed until the, um, between the First and the Second World War. Next. So religious meetings, but also uh, political meetings. Um, and um, they could get very raucous. And uh, I mean, this was the period, of course, of the growth of uh, early socialism. And uh, this press cutting reports, uh, this guy, Richard Jane, got into trouble for uh, uh, rabble rousing uh, at a political meeting in uh, Bushwood, again, just south of the Green Man Roundabout, where most of these meetings seem to have taken place. Uh, notice that the newspaper editors and sub-editors of the time had um, trouble, um, they obviously weren't familiar with the word anarchist, and um, uh, 
um, somehow managed to uh, completely misspell it. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, radical political activity on Bushwood. Next. And then political activity of a, um, an extremely unpleasant kind. Um, this extraordinary photograph um, was taken um, in the 1930s um, with the British Union of Fascists, uh, Oswald Mosley's outfit, uh, holding meetings on Monster Flats. This picture is almost certainly taken near the junction of Capel Road and um, Woodford Road, quite near the, uh, the bandstand site for those of you who, um, or the former bandstand for those of you who know the flats well. And um, so this is uh, July 1938. And uh, there was a counter demonstration. Um, obviously this is the era of the Battle of Cable Street. And uh, there was a counter demonstration and um, Mosley, in fact, never again spoke in East London. Next. Moving on to the wartime period. Um, this is a map um, I researched over a number of years that just gives an idea of the kinds of features uh, there were during the war. I, I have to say this is a schematic and um, not all these things were on the flats in the war at the same time. Um, it simply collects together um, <clears throat> the various bits of data using air photography, photographs, maps, um, <clears throat> and uh, collates it in a form just to make it uh, um, obvious where the different bits were. So you can see the um, the anti-aircraft guns, um, the barrage balloons, um, the prefabs in the uh, bottom right-hand corner that came right at the end of the war. And then over on the left, the, um, the, 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 the prisoner of war camps. So the flats was extensively uh, militarized um, during, the, um, during the war. Um, and we'll see a bit more detail of some of these in the next slides. Next. This photograph was taken on Monster Flats. Um, one of the great advantages, and Mark and I have done these talks uh, over a number of years, and one of the great advantages is that people get interested and then donate us material. And, and I, I would appeal, if any of you've got in your family album pictures that are relevant to some of the things we're talking about, then do please. Um, do please get in touch with us. So this photo came from one of the audience of one of our uh, talks and shows one of the smaller anti-aircraft guns on Watson Platts. And her father, in fact, <coughs> featured in this photograph when she found it in her family album. Almost certainly, I think, a home guard unit. We're not absolutely sure. Um, and this is one of the smaller guns. There were much, much bigger guns. Um, which were the, uh, the very large uh, anti-aircraft guns that blasted away at, um, at the Germans in the early part of the war. Next. There were tragedies on the flats as well because it was, it was a military site and it was a military target. So this, this is a very rare official photograph of Wanstead Flats during the war. There are almost no um, official photographs of the flats. Uh, this photograph was taken by the American Signal Corps and shows a bomb crater and sadly some military personnel died in, in this impact. And uh, to orientate yourself, uh, the trees on the right and those buildings stand on the site of the Aldersbrook changing rooms. Um, so this photograph was taken between the Alexandra Lake and the Aldersbrook changing rooms and um, the anti-aircraft, the, the large anti-aircraft guns would have been back left, although they'd probably been dismounted by this time because this photograph was taken in the second half of um, World War II. Next. Um, this is one of these photographs that's captured, you know, somewhere in Southwest London or somewhere in East London because of wartime censorship, but these are, these are German prisoners of war being marched from 
uh, marched through uh, London streets, uh, much to the curiosity, obviously, of uh, local children who were running along. Um, and this would have dated from after D-Day when uh, large numbers of Germans were captured. And um, there was a German um, prisoner of war camp on Wanstead Flats, and that's well documented. And again, we've written a booklet um, all about the prisoner of war camps. Next. And uh, there is this incredibly useful uh, photograph um, taken by the RAF in uh, on the 7th, we even know the exact date, 7th of August, 1944. And um, <coughs> in the bottom left-hand corner is Forest Gate. And um, in the top there is Belgrove Road. And the double mini roundabouts near the tennis courts are in the top right-hand corner. And the German prisoner of war camp was right up in that corner on Lake House Road where it meets Centre Road. And there are some physical remains on the flats, if you know where to look. Very small, but um, there are some things you can see. And then the, on the left, you see the large black blob of um, what was then the Model Yacht Pond of now Jubilee. And um, there was an Italian prisoner of war camp adjacent to that. And there's various other features. Um, for example, right at the top there, under the blue arrow for Lake Ash Road, you'll see um, large patches of allotments, and we'll see that again. Next. So a, a very important use of the flats in World War II was part of the Dig for Victory campaign, and there were many, many hundreds of um, allotments on um, Wanstead Flats. And again, we've, we've written that up and the whole uh, movement for um, creating um, um, capacity for food growing, both during World War II, but it, it was also there in World War I. Once the flats um, had many um, hundreds of allotments in World War I as well, and there was a long campaign at the end of World War I actually to keep allotments on the flats, uh, which went on for a, a year or so, um, but the campaign was lost and the ground reverted to playing fields and rough grass. Next. Uh, here's that same image, um, but angled slightly differently. Uh, we've just uh, zoomed out a bit. And uh, in the bottom right hand corner, uh, along Capel Road there, um, large patches of allotments can be seen uh, together with other features. Um, but allotments covered very large areas of the flats and on the top on the flats, that's Harrow Road, what is now Harrow Road playing fields. And that is almost entirely covered in allotments. Next. And uh, just one more aerial view. This is, um, <coughs> this is uh, Harrow Road. The railway line angling across the photograph left to right is the Barking Gospel Oak. Um, the very large building there is no longer there. That's Neville's Bakery. And then you can see towards the top of the picture uh, the, the, the sort of patchwork area, and those are allotments up on Harrow Road. Playing fields and to their left, you can see a small prefab estate um, because um, emergency housing was built on the flats in the war. Um, those prefabs are on the site of the two tower blocks, uh, John Walsh and Fred Wig, which are on Montague Road. The two Walton Forest Council tower blocks sit on the site of that prefab estate. Next. And uh, these are the prefabs on Capel Road. This photo is looking east along Capel Road and um, gives you um, a very nice impression of um, why these prefab estates were so popular with their gardens. Uh, people, of course, living in a detached bungalow with um, indoor facilities when so many people in those days lived in tiny rooms in shared houses with shared toilets. Um, prefabs were the height of luxury and uh, were much loved. And um, they were only supposed to be there a couple of years, but of course survived, in this case, um, survived until about 1960 on Wanstead Flats, when the area reverted to um, playing fields, when it was relayed out by the Corporation of London as playing fields. 
By the way, um, there are a couple of cherry trees um, on the edge of Wonsdale Flats on Capel Road, um, which will be coming into flower now. And they, they are, those cherry trees are survivals of these gardens. There are obviously some very keen gardeners there. Next. This is um, not Wonsdale Flats, this is um, uh, Leighton Flats. Um, the locals know it, of course, as Hollow Ponds, just adjacent to the lakes. And um, this is a cheaper, slightly nastier type of prefab. These are, these are Nissen huts, whereas the ones in the previous picture were rather superior. The previous ones were built by East Ham Council, who had a, a bit more money and um, built more luxurious prefabs. These are the basic Nissen huts. And again, these survived on Whips Cross Road, very close to Whips Cross Hospital, until about 1960 when they were demolished and the ground was returned to um, its current usage. Next. Um, one of the, I mean, Mark and I are uh, rather obsessive about collecting oddities about Wonstead Flats. And one of the greatest oddities is in the immediate post-war period, um, there was a continuing military presence. And uh, there was in fact a parachute training school on Wonstead Flats just briefly in the um, second half of the 1940s. And um, Again, this is an example of a photograph we've only just acquired in the last month or two. We've known about the parachute training school for a long time, but we've never had photographic evidence, but here it is. And it came from, again, a uh, family album. Uh, a colleague of mine was clearing uh, some of his mother's effects and uh, they came across this rather wonderful photograph. Um, so the uh, parachutists leapt out of the old wartime barrage balloons, which were elevated presumably to several thousand feet. They jumped out, opened their parachute and hoped for the best. If you look very, very carefully, I think it, you can actually see cows on the landing field as well. So this is about 1947, 1948. And um, certainly there are people locally who, who remember the parachute training school. Next. And uh, just to bring the story sort of up to date, um, there have been, uh, you know, continuing threats to the flats. And uh, some of you will remember um, uh, quite a large scale campaign that took place in the run up to the Olympics, where the Metropolitan Police wanted to take over part of Wanstead Flats as a so called uh, muster station as, a, as, a, as basically a temporary police base to gather their resources ready to go down to the Olympic Park. And there was quite a, a, a rigorous, a, a vigorous campaign uh, that went on in about 2011 to try and resist this enclosure of the flats. And uh, notice this poster, which dates from uh, 2011, consciously echoes um, in its fonts and in its design and in its uh, iconography. Um, the 19th century campaigns to stop enclosures. Next. The campaign uh, did achieve something, um, but eventually the, the muster station was built. And um, here's a picture of um, the Metropolitan Police on the flats on the muster station site, which was um, uh, coincided with the fairground site. And there you see John Walsh and Fred Wig in the background there. Um, the campaign did achieve something because the Metropolitan Police paid a rent um, for the few months they were there. They paid a rent of about £170,000. And um, that money was uh, allocated by the corporation to the further refurbishment of the Jubilee Pond, uh, which, um, although it had been refurbished in the 1990s, was leaking very badly. and. Uh, needed further money spent on it. So the Metropolitan Police rent was put to good uses on the flats. Next. And um, innovations uh, continue in the forest and the, the, the forest and the forest land continues to change. Um, in September, 2020, um, cattle were reintroduced not to uh, Wanstead Flats, but to Wanstead Park on an experimental basis. And I'm sure many of you uh, really enjoyed seeing the longhorn cattle. These are these, are these wonderful longhorn cattle, a rare breed that are very suitable to 
graze on this, uh, this kind of rough grass. And um, so the cattle were back in our parts of the world for the first time in, uh, in uh, 25 years. And the good news is they will be back in um, 2021, um, probably actually in slightly larger numbers. There were only three in uh, 2020, but um, there should be larger numbers coming. Uh, again, in the park, not, uh, not on the flat. Next. And um, to bring the story right up to date, um, obviously uh, in the last year we've faced the pandemic and um, there's a long history of the, if you like, the British state taking over parts of the flats for um, in times of national emergency. We've just seen an example with the muster station. We've seen all the examples from World War II. And um, this is Manor Park Flats, the, the triangle. And um, of course, a very large temporary mortuary was built there uh, last summer uh, as part of the response to COVID. Um, I think, to be honest, it was little used in the end and it was taken away. And um, a big effort went into restoring the grassland. And this is the uh, part of the grassland restoration. By the way, the uh, circle of trees in the background, you can see, mark the site of a Cold War underground bunker. Uh, some of you will remember there used to be a surface building there, a small concrete building, and that led down through a staircase to uh, a very large underground building, which was East Ham Council's Cold War control bunker. The bunker, of course, is still there. It's just been uh, left and buried and no doubt now full of water. Um, so and yet another somewhat unusual use of Wanstead Flats. And um, just a reminder, as, as we think about the, the COVID pandemic, that of course, forest land has been massively heavily used during the lockdowns for exercise and uh, recreation. And um, there are even indications that in parts of the forest, there's been a tenfold increase in, in visitors. So Wanstead Flats, continues to serve this extraordinarily important role to the, uh, the people of East London. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, our, our booklets, of course. Um, we've written um, booklets on uh, these various themes and um, they're available from us. Um, I'll put an email address in the chat shortly. Uh, they're also available for the, from the wonderful Newham Bookshop. And uh, they're also available from a little shop on Seabrook Road in Forest Gate, number eight Seabrook Road, who uh, sell them. And um, yes, you can get far more detail on some of the things we've talked about in the, uh, in the booklet. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That was excellent. I think everybody enjoyed that. I think there's another slide to come where I think you thank everybody if I just, whoops, type on that. Um, <laughs> which is great. And also, I think Mark has just published a, a book recently, which you also may be interested in. Um, maybe Mark wants to tell you a little bit more about that before it opens up for questions. I'll just um, unmute him. Mark, you'll have to unmute yourself. For yeah. some reason I can't okay. do it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Tony. It actually, it actually comes out in, in May. Um, uh, it's it's really it's really a, a sort of more uh, of a, a, a closer look at the um, the campaigns in uh, London to save uh, open spaces like Epping Forest, and it sort of it tries to restore sort of ordinary people the role of ordinary people because we hear a lot about the great and the good, um, who indeed did a lot of good work in saving um, open spaces in London. We don't hear very much about in fact, we hear almost nothing at all about the ordinary Londoners who, whose protests, whose petitioning, um, whose pressure on MPs made a major contribution, major contribution to saving uh, areas like uh, Epping Forest. And it's called the People's Forest because that's what they called it. They said it is the People's Forest. Um, so, yeah, um, coming out in May from the University of Hertfordshire Press, Newham Bookshop will have copies. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to both Mark and Peter mm -hmm. for a really stimulating talk. 